before um, we talked about a lot of things uh, in in the morning already. Um, public key cryptography. We talked about uh, we talked about um, protecting the DNS infrastructure and what kind of attacks you could have. Do people have any questions? And feel free to ask them in Spanish because then I'll put on the headphone for translation. Anybody? Did everybody understand what I was talking about? Really? Oh, oh. Um, I, I, yeah, uh, yeah, was the translation correct? No, no, that's not, that's not, that's not fair. Um, okay, we're going to talk a little bit more technology and um, a little bit more uh, detail. Yeah. I was not speaking in Dutch. Dat is helemaal niet waar. Een valse beschuldiging. Um, anyway. Um, details. I'm going to talk about stuff as it appears in DNS. And uh, one of the things that I assume you will have some knowledge on, and if not, you will have to pay very good uh, uh, attention because I'm going to repeat these terms an awful lot of times, is the concept of resource records and resource record sets. A resource record is a complete piece of information that belongs to a certain name. So, for instance, www.nlnetlabs.nl as a as an A resource record, an address resource record, and that consists out of the following properties. A name in the DNS namespace, www.nlnetlabs.nl. Remember, this is a hierarchical system, starting from the root, NL, going back to more detail, NLNetlabs, and finally the, the domain uh, part of it, um, where, where most of the information is, is over here. Um, this is the name. Then there is the TTL value, the time to live. This says how long can you store this in, in, in a cache. Then there is a class, because there are multiple classes of information by design in the DNS. And because of that, we only use one class, the in class, the internet class. There are other classes as well, like the chaos class, which you might see occasionally. But in general, everything is in the internet class. The concept of using other classes in the DNS has never caught on. So you will see always see IN here. Then there is the type of resource record. And the type here is an A. That means an A record. There are many other types. There are types like MX, uh, uh, mail exchanges, TXT for a piece of text. And depending on the type, there is so-called R data, resource data. And for an A record, that is an address. For uh, 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 an MX record, which says uh, where a mail server is, it's the name of a mail server with a certain priority attached to that. For a text record, is it's a field with a text string, and so on and so forth. There are um, at least, how many are there? About 60, 70. Uh, resource records defined with, uh, with, uh, with, with specific types and specific R data. A resource record set is a set of data with the same name, the same class, and the same type. So if www.nlnetlabs.nl comes with multiple addresses, then the combination of all the addresses makes up the resource record set. It's the complete set of resources with the same name, same name, the same class, and the same type. Um, why did I, didn't I, uh, oh, the, and the reason why um, the set is defined in this way is that in DNS, so the question is why do you leave out the TTL 
in the, uh, in, in the definition of the RR set. Um, the reason is that the RR set is what you, what you get back in the DNS because questions are always based on three properties. Those three properties are the name, the class, and the type. A DNS application will always ask for a name, a type, in a specific class. Well, that class always, for all the purposes we're talking about, is the in class. So these three things is what, what you do a lookup for. Um, now, per definition, the TTL needs to be the same for all the values. If not, that's an error condition. Let's sign. So it's not part of the definition of an R set, but because of the conventions, the TTL must also be the same. But as part of the definition, same name, class, and type, um, uh, we, we construct an R set. And as a result of that definition, the TTL needs to be the same. But that's, it's a, it's a little bit of a protocol design uh, uh, thing but you have to remember two things here questions are always asked based on a tree tree tuple how do you say that in English a triplet tree tuple tree 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 tuple see English is not my native language easy either so and the questions are always asked based on name class and type Remember, or I haven't said this yet, but the DNS is not a search engine. You don't type in a word and you expect something random to come back. No, you ask for three specific things. And you always get the answer based on that specific question. Name, class, and type. And all the information you can get back for a name, class, and type is in an R set. And an R set is made up of independent resource records. Research record sets are made up of research sets. In the DNS sec, the RR sets are assigned. It's not the individual RRs. It's always, that's the atomic piece of data. Those concepts you will hear more often. Names, TTL, classes, types, R data, that kind of stuff, that wording, I will use all the time. And again, the reason why you go into this is because of troubleshooting. Because I want you to understand at least some of the basics of what happens under the hood. You don't have to write software yourself to do this. You don't you know, have to have in-depth knowledge. But you know that the idea is that once you've seen this, you sort of know where to look when you have problems. I hope that when you deploy the in a second, you have a problem Hey, I've heard this before. I have to look at these slide sets. Or this is something. so. What kind of technology did we use again for generating signatures? Anybody? What kind of technology did we use for generating signatures? I explained about public key cryptography. Remember. So public key cryptography is what we use for generating signatures. We have a private key and we have a public key. What do you need to validate a signature, to check a signature? Is that the private key or the public key? I'm going to ask somebody in the audience, that mystery there. Do you know what you need, a private key or a public key? If you have a signature and you want to check the validity of the signature, would you know? Yeah, you. Oh, yep. Some, some. Public key. Public. Yeah, indeed, the public key. So you need the public key. Very good. Well. That means that that public key needs to live in the DNS. You need to get it some, from somewhere. So what we have is a resource record by which we put the public key in the DNS. But, uh, need to have the signatures. Yeah. Those signatures you also put in the, in the DNS. 
So you need resource records with signatures, the RRSIG. Now, there is more. There is a thing called the delegation signer, which is a pointer to build chain of trust. And this falls down like a piano out of the sky, and you don't know what to do with it, but I'll explain that DS record later. And yet there is another thing. It's called the NSEC record, or the NSEC-3 records. There are two varieties of the same beast. Because if you want to make sure that something is not there, if you ask a question and you get an answer back that says, this doesn't exist, you also want to be able to prove it. And generating a signature over something that doesn't exist is hard. It's impossible. So you need to have a trick. The NSEC record provides that trick. I'm going to explain that all later. Yeah? So in DNSSEC, you sign stuff, you sign resource records, and each resource record will have an RRSIG, and you have DNS keys by which you can validate everything. Yeah. And then there's these DS pointers and NSEC records, but I'll show you all of those. Hey, wait. This begs a question. The public key. You put the public key in the DNS. Where do you leave the private key? Who would know where you put the private key? Where do you keep the private key? Harder. You said something, but you need to speak up. A safe place. Yeah, absolutely correct. You keep, you keep your private key in a, uh, in, in, in a safe place. The, what I always say is public key cryptography has two problems. You need to make the public key public and keep the private key private. Both are hard. Keep that in the back of your mind. Keeping that private key private is very important. And making sure that the public key is made public in a way that everybody can trust it is also hard. It's very hard to scale. Yeah. It's the problem of you getting a, a public key from somebody and you say, you know, is this really the public key of the person that owns that private key? It's a very difficult problem. But we use the DNS for that. We put public keys with the DNS key in the, public, in the, in the database. Well, joy. A um, public key in the DNS looks like this. You have the owner name, which falls from the screen. Why is that? Oh, anyway, it falls from the screen. It says nlnetlabs.nl. And again, this is a resource record type, eh? a resource record. Remember, it has a name, it has a TTL, it has a class, and it has a type, and then R data. So the R data starts here, and it's all the things that belong to a DNS key. And there's a, a bunch of stuff here. A bunch of data that you need for administrative purposes. Let's see what those are. Flags. The flags is a 16-bit flags, and it's, it's, it's displayed alphanumerical. Um, here it's 256. The flags are odd things. And in fact, there's only one flag that is actively used. It's to signal the purpose of a key. And it's the first, uh, the first bit, um, which means that if this value is, uh, is odd or even, uh, you can distinguish the purpose. It's either 256 currently or 257. And I'll explain to you later what the differences are. That flag field is an indicator when you have to do troubleshooting. When you look at the value, if it's even, um, it's a zone signing key. If it's odd, it's a, a key signing key. Um, and what those are, you'll learn later. Uh, protocol, 8 bits. Value 3. I'll tell you what, you will always see the value 3 there. Uh, DNSSEC was designed over several iterations, and we used to have uh, a key data, and the intention was that you could use key for all kinds of public key material. But we decided that we did something wrong and we could improve the protocol, so we, we took all the data, we created something new, and those, those, those 
those protocol fields were left untouched and there's now just sitting eight bits in the protocol with a value three and it will never ever vary. At least that's not the expectation. So this is an unimportant. But this one, the eight bits algorithm is, there's a five there. Going back to that picture that I showed you of the, the, the signature validation. Remember that you have a message. That message, there's a digest going down, digest arrow going down. That was a very particular protocol to generate a shorter number out of your message, a hash function. And then there's an encryption function. The combination of the encryption function and uh, the digest function is, um, is the algorithm that is used to sign data. Because at the other side, you need to be able to take a public key, do the right decryption, and then also be able to calculate the right hash. Yeah? It's going back to that picture that I showed some time ago. Maybe, maybe I should be able to. I'm, maybe I should just go back and show you that picture. Um, this one. So you have that message. There is a digest applied, a hash, and one of the hash functions is MD5, another hash function is J1, a, a third hash function is J256. All those uh, are particular names of functions. So in order to do the validation at the other side, you need to be able to do the same message digest. So when you create a signature, you have to signal some way to the receiving side which function to use. And you also have to uh, signal in some way which function to use here. So the combination of two, these two functions and the, the public key algorithm that is used here is called, for instance, RSA. Uh, there are more. There's also elliptic curve, public key cryptography, the whole, a bunch of different types of uh, 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 um, uh, of um, uh, public key cryptography. The calculation, the, 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 the two things that you, you, you need to know to perform all this is stored in an algorithm. So it's information that you need at the other side in order to perform the validation. So that one was un uh, uh, unused. So this number is the algorithm thing. This key is used with RSA J1. I know that by head, because five is often used. And then that is the public key. It's a big number, which is uh, stored in base 64 elements. That's a particular way of displaying large numbers, binary numbers. But it's a big number. RSIC data. Again, lots of information. Remember, we're talking about an R, which has a name has a TTL, has a class, and then this is the type of record. The type of record comes with a lot of R data. This one, you re if you want to do troubleshooting, you sort of have to understand all the fields that are in here, because this is providing you with a lot of information. The first 16 bits are the type covered. It is the thing that you see here. This says that this is a signature over the nlnetlabs.nl A records. So it's the resource record set of type A. So all the names nlnetlabs.nl of type A over which this provides the signature information. First field, this is a signature over nlnetlabs.nl. Very easy to see. There's a, this, is the, this is the thing you need to know. Um, second part. Second part is the algorithm. You need to be able to validate, which means that you need to know which hashing digest algorithm has been used, 
and which public key. So in order to do that, there needs to be a signal. That's the doubt. The next one is a rather esoteric little value. It's the number of labels covered when making the signal. Here it says the number of labels covered is two. Exactly the amount of labels you find here. Now suppose that you have a wildcard expansion. One important thing of DNSSEC is that DNSSEC has been designed so that signatures are not generated in the client. Which means everything can be pre-computed if you would like to. It also means that wildcard expansion, wildcard is exp expansion is when you have the so-called wildcard in your zone, then any question that cannot be directly matched, but matched against that wildcard will get a response. So it's a substitution. You see this often if you have a web server and you want to have that known by many names. Wildcards are. Um, now, that wildcard, um, you can get, you can get a, a, a you, if you need to validate a signature over a wildcard, you actually need to be able to detect that a wildcard has been used. You do that by comparing this number to this answer here. If this is a longer answer, if this would have been www.nl.nl, then by the virtue of seeing this number two, you would know it is a wildcard substitution. You would actually know how much to strip off of the of the of the label and replace that with a star in order to do the validation. So this is a rather technical little thing, but if you see a mismatch between this number and the number of labels here, you know that you have to do with a wildcard expansion. You actually can test that. Another thing. So we have the TTL, the original TTL. Why is that? Also a, a tricky thing. Remember that if a recursive name server has asked a question to an authority server, it will store the record locally. And it will count down the TTL, one by one by one by one. Now, if I'm sitting on the other end of this uh, recursive name server, and I want to do DNSSEC validation, I ask the name server for a resource record uh, uh, set from that name server, I get an answer, and the TTL contains the value as is currently in that cache. So the, the TTL has been counted down. Uh, instead of 3600, it now reads 20, which means that in 20 seconds, the, the recursive name server will go back and, and fetch a new value. But if I want to do validation at this side, then I would need to know what the original pieces were that were signed. Uh, because when the record got signed, the TTL got signed as well, the original TTL. So what, what I need, and this is that, that what signals it, is the original TTL. So I can replace the 20 that I have from the caching name server by 3600 and then do the validation. I reconstruct the original information that was originally signed. Okay? So this is bookkeeping information that I actually need to do validation. The next two um, fields are signature expiration and signature inception. In contrast to PKIs, X509's difficulties, there is no revocation in the NSA. There is no mechanism to revoke. There is only mechanisms to indicate how long a key is valid. This key is valid between uh, May, uh, 11th of May, 11, 14 hours, 45 minutes, and 23 seconds, to a month later, uh, 11th of June. Yeah. Sorry, um, I misspoke. This signature is valid. The signature. So, if I get an A record, and the time is not between 
this interval, this signature is not valid. Timing is very important in the DNS, suddenly. It used to be that without DNS set, the DNS had only relative times, counters that counted down, the TTLs, but now suddenly we got absolute time. And this is also why, if you do DNSSEC, you really need to have good time. If you do not have good time, you will introduce errors. Oh, there's more information here. Now, suppose I want to validate this signature. Then I need to be able to find the public key of the key pair with which the signature was generated. So somewhere there is somebody with a private key. He has a public key as well. The public key is stored in the DNS. That private key has signed this RR set, the A record with nlabs.ml. And now I'm sitting there and I say, I have a signature here. Where do I find the public key? Where can I find it? Well, it is these two pieces of information that will help you with it. This says that the, the public key for with which this signature is generated is at anelnetlabs.nl. So if I'm a validator, I will query for the DNS key at anelnetlabs.nl and get the next. I will get a resource record set, a bunch of keys probably. And I need to pick one. Now, keys come with a sort of key tag, a little number that helps make that picking easier. And that is this number. So, the domain name here is where I can find the key set, the bunch of keys that are potentially used to generate the signature, and this value is a helper function to select the appropriate key from that key set. This is what the software uses to do its magic. And finally, there's the binary material that constitutes the signature. It's one thing that I would like to tell you here, or show you here, is that this is the notation in zone file format. And if you ever edit zone files, normally you put everything on one line. But with all these records, everything becomes very hard to read. Um, and using the brackets is a trick to distribute your content over multiple lines. So if you edit zone files, you can use brackets uh, to, to split the fields of a multiple zone uh, lines. Questions so far? These are the nitty gritty details. We're, we're deeply into, into details. These are important details because this is where your troubleshooting begins and this is where your troubleshooting ends. If there's one thing that you can take back from this course, it's actually these two slides that I showed you or this couple of slides, so that you can actually go back and see, oh yeah, and now I'm looking at an expiration date. So keep this in the back of your mind. You had a question? Yeah. Do all our R sets need to be signed with the same private key, is the question that Jeff asked. The answer is no. You can have multiple private keys, um, and you can therefore also generate multiple signatures over the same data. And in practice, that will happen. What um, you will then see is that you have one or more uh, uh, signatures over over data, uh, and as long as one validates, you're in business. You're okay. um, so there can be multiple private keys, and there can be multiple signatures, and there can be all kinds of mix of them. But as soon as there is a signature, you need to be able to find the, uh, uh, at least one of the signatures needs to have a valid DNS key um, that is fetchable. When we get to talk about key management in the afternoon, which is the tricky operational part of DNS, we get into the those data. So now we know 
how to validate data. We have a signature and we have a DNS key. And we can do so in a zone, an administrative boundary piece. But we also want to be able to build a change of trust. If I trust, say, the root signatures, I want to be able to trust um, uh, the Colombian uh, top-level domain. And once I trust the Colombian, because I know you do DNSSEC, uh, once I trust the Colombian uh, top-level domain, I need to go uh, to, the, to, the, to the customers of that domain and make sure that, for instance, the com.co, uh, coca-cola.com, you use two levels, huh? and, uh, um, is, is done. so we need to build a chain of trust, and we need to be able to say, in some way, when I delegate the responsibility to maintain a certain piece of the zone file, I also need to delegate the responsibility uh, uh, to maintain the trust. That is done with a, um, uh, the so-called DSR. The there is no, there's, it's no coincidence that DS and NS, NS are more or less sick, uh, um, uh, a similar uh, types of records. The line here, parent is authoritative for DS in the child zone um, and, and not for the, this is a very technical um, um, remark. Um, but at, when we did the protocol design, we were that scared about the DS record. Um, it's, it was the first record for which only the parent had information and the child didn't have its information. Um, the way we talk about parents and childs in the DNS is that um, uh, at some point you do a delegation with a, a, an NS record going from, you know, you remember this, this zone walk, eh? so the root says, uh, you have to go to the uh, .nl servers. A bunch of NS records are sent and, and one points to the NL servers. Um, in fact, NS records are at the parent and at the child and they're supposed to be the same, all that. DS records are never at the child. It's very awkward. And that was a protocol detail that, that gave some people a little bit of a, of a belly ache. It was, it was really something new. This is. Uh, special uh, little beast from a protocol design but you don't care about that so. yeah what um, uh, what George was saying here sorry I'm, I need to go through the animation what George was saying is if you want to do DNSSEC and you want to be able to build a chain of trust, you cannot do that on your own. You have to, what is that? Oh. Um. Oh, sorry. What happens here? Help. Um, apparently, there is no power on this power brick, uh, and I'm l running out of uh, power. Um, you, um, <laughs> um, I need to get electricity before I can continue. No? No power yet? No? No? Neither. Okay, just... I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what we do? Ah, okay, good. Thank you. Just plug it in. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. 
you might have a, a dirty power brick here and the fuses might have blown. I don't know. <sighs> Where was I? Okay, we're back in business. Something goes awfully wrong, I don't know why. Uh -huh. This is the um, This is where we are. Whew. Um well, I uh, uh, recapture. Oh yeah, this is about uh, a building change of trust. Um Let's see how this looks like. Um, so there is a bunch of information there. Suppose that we are in the uh, NLNet lab zone and we have a delegation to lab.nlnetlabs.nl. So this is my internal DNS and I want to uh, give the authority to maintain records to a separate group within my, my institution inside the lab. I want to have the lab thing. So I make a delegation to the NS lab and at the same time I say um, the, uh, if you're building a chain of trust uh, then the delegation uh, information for labs um, points to a DNS key with a certain set of properties. It's basically just saying as the uh, uh, NS record says uh, you have to go to that server um, in order to follow the domain tree. Um, the uh, delegation record says you have to go to the next key in order to uh, do the follow the chain of trust in that delegation hierarchy. Well, what information is there? There is a so-called um, um, key tag. That is the number by which you select a DNS key out of a set of keys when you when you obtain a DNS key R set. So if you build the chain of trust here, you will ask the DNS key RR set from lab.nl labs.nl. You'll get a DNS key set and you uh, pick the one that has a key tag called 3112. Obviously there is information about the algorithm which is for which this particular key is used. Um, you will see that algorithm come by all the time. And then here is another digest type, because what is published here is the so-called digest 
of the public key at the other side, just to make things a little more efficient in terms of, of the payload from the network. Uh, there are a couple of, there's digest type 1 and digest type 2 are now defined. And then this is information about the DS record, so about the key. So the DS record of lab.nl, net lab.nl, is actually a mapping of one of the DNS keys in uh, at, at lab.nl, uh, lab So it's a mapping from a key to another. It's public key information. You don't have the key itself, but once you have the DS record, you can actually easily get it from the, from the system. Ooh, then there is another beauty. I'm only going to explain the NSEC record here. I'm not going to explain you the NSEC tree record, which also exists. But that is a bridge too far, probably. But it's an important one. Um, let's see. So we know that the DNS records, the DNS SIGs, can be created about, uh, over data that is in a particular zone. www.coca-cola.com. You've got uh, mailserver.coca-cola.com. You've got a bunch of things in your coca-cola.com zone. And you can generate signatures over all those. But what you cannot do you cannot generate a signature for something that is likely not to exist in the Coca-Cola. So, like a host name that says Pepsi is nice dot Coca-Cola dot com. There's probably not a host name with that, you know, with that name in the Coca-Cola uh, com zone. But you cannot sign that because you cannot sign everything that is in there. And remember, DNSSEC was made so that you do not have to have the private keys in your system. Uh, in order to give answers. Private keys, you want to keep private, so you want to shield them. You don't want to have them on production. So, in order to make sure that you can prove that certain data does not exist, you have to give proof what, does, what actually does exist. And the way you do that is by building so-called NSEC chains. It points, the NSEC R data points to the next domain name in the zone. And it also lists what are the exact existing RR types for a specific name. And the last NSEC rep, the record wraps around to the first. And what that means, um, I hope to explain in a bit. too far here. Um, suppose you want to prove you have a zone. And in the zone you have three records. You have the record, the three names. You have the, rec the name A, you have the, the name O, and you have the name Q. A, O, and Q. And they all live in the coca.com a.coca-cola.com exists. O.coca-cola.com exists. And Q.coca-cola.com exists. Nothing else. If I were to ask for PepsiCola the school.com, I would need to have proof that PepsiCola.com does not exist. What happens then is that the answer you will get back is saying between the name O and the name Q, there are no records. Pepsi Cola is cool, uh, Pepsi Cola is nice, but Coca Cola, Cola com sorts between O and Q. It starts with a D, between O and Q. There is a certain ordering in zones, and what happens is that there will be a lookup performed, and the lookup will see it's not there. And the thing that wraps around it, which gives proof that something is not there, is the NSEC record that points from O to Q. 
So the NSEC records basically gives intervals within a zone where nothing else exists. You can use that as a proof. Um, so how does this record look? This is the owner name. It says www.nlnetlabs. TTL class NSEC type. And then it says the next name in the zone is nlnetlabs.nl. Basically says that between www.nlnetlabs and wrapping back all the way to the top of the zone to nlnetlabs.nl, there's nothing there. So if I were to ask the servers that are responsible for nlnetlabs.nl, does z.nlnetlabs.nl exist, I would get an answer back with this particular NSEC record, which says between the www.nlnetlabs.nl and nlnetlabs.nl, nothing exists. And since I know that Z sorts between WW and nothing, so to, and, and the start of the zone, I'm good. So when you sign a zone file, if you sign a zone, what a signer will do, and you never have to do this by hand, you never generate or type zone, NSEC records or R6, and all the stuff that we talk about today, you never ever touch that by hand. Never. As soon as you have to touch that by hand, you're do doing something wrong. Remember that too. Yeah? If there's anything you want to learn, if there's anything you should have learned today, is that this is all done by machines. But what happens if you sign a zone is that it will sort all the uh, uh, names in your zone and it will generate pointers. Linked lists through your zone. Completely automatic. It could also be that I ask for uh, a mail server, the existence of a mail server, an MX record, at the name www.nlnetlabs.nl. Now I have to have proof that there is no MX record at that name. The way that is proven is by a list of the, the, the resource records that do exist at that name. So, www.nlnetlabs.nl has the research records A, RR6, and NC, and nothing else. If I ask for a text record, I don't get a text record, and I can prove by the NSEC record that it doesn't exist. It's the types that exist and the next name in this chain. It's a little bit more tricky. It's gonna get a little bit more tricky. The NSEC resource record, as I just argued, claims proof of non-existence. If you ask for a specific resource, for, for a specific name, then you get the proof that that name does not exist by the thing that wraps between it. But because there are wildcards possible in the zone, you also need to prove to get the that there is no wildcard. And the wildcard is also a record that sorts. So you, need, you often see two NSEC RR records that actually provide you the proof that there is no wildcard and there is no exception. Two NSEC records, the same name, to prove the non existence. Name error. Proof. So that's the NSEC. The, the server response is a no error, then you have an empty answer section, and the NSEC helps you to prove that the, 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 the type did not exist. You can do that by looking at which type do exist, and if the thing you ask for is not in that list, you know, it doesn't exist. So more than one NSEC record might be in the response. And remember, this stuff is generated by tools. You don't have to do the handy work. This created a problem. There are many places in the world, specifically TODs, but also corporate environments, where giving away the host name is uh, considered security breach or policy breach. 
for instance, um, some people interpret uh, European privacy regulations in such a way that if you would have the complete content of, of a um, um, of a TLD zone, you could use that as a primary key into the WIS database, which is uh, privacy sensitive information, and hence that information might not be made public. So zone transfers of TLDs are forbidden for that reason. Um, deploying NSAC in such a zone would give the ability for somebody to say, I'm going to ask a question. I get back an interval saying between A and O, nothing exists. So now I know that between A and O, nothing exists. I'm going to ask O for the NSAC records. I get the next thing in the zone, and the, which is Z. And I'm going to ask Z what is the next thing in the zone, which is the top of the zone. I'm going to ask the top of the zone what's the next thing. It's A. And then I'll get back to O. And then I have the complete content of the zone. So with the NSAC uh, available, you could do a complete walk and get all the zone uh, content uh, that, is, that, that is in your zone. Some people argue, uh, to be honest, I'm one of those, what is in the DNS is public information. On the other hand, I can understand and relate to uh, the requirements that come from policymakers and people that have a different perspective on how you do security than I do. Um, and zone enumeration was actually a very important uh, uh, barrier to the implementation of DNSSEC in the early days. And I'm speaking about around 2000, 2005. Um, so the solution that was developed was um, um, uh, a new variation on the NSEC record called the NSEC 3 record, um, which is complicated, hard to troubleshoot, and even more difficult than NSEC is conceptually. Um, but I'm going to try and explain it anyway. Um, what it does is, you remember you had this linked list of, uh, of names, A to C, C to N, N to Z, Z all the way back to the beginning of the zone. And what NSEC does is, uh, we're going to use a hash. It creates hashes of these names and then creates a um, linked list over the hashes. So very complicated information. Uh, 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 unreadable names that reflect the non-existence of the, uh, um, um, the original uh, pieces of data. Um, there's a lot of extra information in NSEC records like assault, uh, the number of iterations made for uh, things, and that's all to protect against uh, dictionary attacks and that kind of stuff. And I'm not going to explain it to you because I think it's a little bit too much for uh, people who are first encountered with DNSSEC. But if you run a huge TLD, then uh, there is another future there, which is the opt-out resource record, which allows you to generally include uh, DNSSEC records and not having to sign everything at once. Special features uh, created more or less for uh, uh, people who operated .com and .de and all the, the very big zones out there. So we had a DNS key, which is the public key, an RRC, which is the signature. We have the DS record to build a chain of trust, and the NSEC and its variation NSEC3, to prove the non-existence of stuff. Those are the five things that make up DNSSEC. Now you can store other keys in the DNS, and people do so. And tomorrow in the keynote, I will get to uh, a very particular uh, kind of application, which is called Dane. Um, but you can use the DNS, uh, DNS key, uh, uh, the DNS key R set is for, for DNSSEC. But you can also store X509 certificate, IPSEC keys, and SSHFP. There should have been a space here. Who of you uses SSH? SSH? Anybody? So, who presses yes at the first time they do a connection and it displays that fingerprint? 
You know what that's called? Leap of faith. <laughs> what is another word of, uh, for a leap of faith? Yes, stupid. <laughs> Actually, suppose that you do that leap of faith uh, and you don't have to do it because the fingerprint is actually stored in the DNS. That's the idea. The fingerprint is stored in the DNS, so at the moment you do a, a, a look, uh, you connect to an SSH server you've never been to before, you do a lookup in the DNS and see if the fingerprint is, is there for that host. Very nice application. You do need secure DNS sec, uh, you do need a secure DNS for that to be more than a leap of faith. Storing public key information in the DNS is actually a very nice innovative, innovative uh, um, uh, 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 application. <sighs> so this is where we are now. Any questions until now? So, I, um, uh, I, this is hard stuff. So I, I feel free to ask if you if you have, if you if you want to, but. Otherwise, I'm going to go into uh, delegating signing authority. Um, who, uh, who, who does DNS uh, management on a daily basis? Sort of, you know, who has DNS experience? On a daily basis? Uh, th there's a gentleman over there raising his hand. Um, uh, um, you may answer in Spanish if you if you want to, or in English. Just put on. Yeah, it's, it's you. Um, um, you know the difference between a zone and a domain? A zone and a domain. Uh, okay, it's a tricky one. Um, is there anybody who could explain a zone and a domain difference to me? Oh, that's, okay, uh, let me do a step back then. This is, uh, it's not that important, but... Um, so a domain is everything below a certain domain name. So if you have the com domain, it's everything that ends in com. Everything. So www.coca-cola.com is in the com domain. And everything in the world is in the root domain. And everything under www.nlnetlabs is in the www.nlnetlabs domain. So a domain, if you picture the domain tree as a big tree, is everything below a specific branch. You cut off a branch, everything that falls off, okay, cut off a branch of a tree, everything that falls off is a domain. A zone, however, is an administrative piece of data. So it's basically the guys who maintain a part of the tree, a part of the branch. Um, so the people of .com are responsible for the ferry sign is responsible for maintaining the .com zone. They know that they delegate certain domains underneath there to another zone owner. And that zone owner might actually decide to delegate further. So a zone is an administrative boundary. It has the top, the beginning of the zone. And in the zone file you can see that by the start of authority record, the SOA record, the beginning of the zone. And when you delegate away, those domains are for somebody else. Zone is a specific little piece of data in the, uh, in the DNS. And, uh, and the domain is the branch that falls off when you start solving. This is important because DNSSEC Signing is always on a per zone basis, never on a per domain basis, but on a zone basis. You sign 
the stuff over which you're responsible for. If you've delegated responsibility using delegation, somebody else um, needs to do the same here. Now, suppose that I sign my resource records and the gentleman over there um, uh, signs his resource records and we want to validate those things. We, when we need to validate, what do we need? If we got information with our SIGs and we get public keys from VNS, but how do we know we can trust those keys? If I get signed signatures from a zone that is called unix.os.net, so this zone is signed, and I get information, and I want to do the validation, and I'm living somewhere else in the, in the domain tree, say here on the market.port.money.net domain, and I want to do validation. I actually have to talk to these people. I have to get them on the phone and say, what's your public key? Because if I trust any public key, which is in the DNS, we're back in leap of faith. And leap of faith was, George, are you paying attention? Leap of faith is stupid, yes. Yeah? DNS keys, you need to know where you get them from. So these out of band things, they do not scale. So how do you do that? Well, you use the DNS to distribute keys. Secure islands, as we call them, little aisles where people do signing with nothing above, are problematic. Yeah? You want those secure entry points, you want to get them to, to, through the DNS. And ideally, you can use one trusted key to establish the authenticity of all the other keys in the system. That's the ideal case. And if you want, you can trust more keys and establish the trust in different ways. But ideally, you only need one. It doesn't say you must only use one, but you only need one. So the ideal case, you can build chains of trust, as we call them, from the root down. You configure the public key of the root zone, and then you walk all the way down, following delegations from uh, the root to CO, from CO to com.co, and from com.co to, say, Coca-Cola. And in order to do that, you need the parents in the DNS context, the parents to sign the keys of the children. Yeah? And the delegation is done by the DNS. Now, there's a problem here. If I have a key here and I use that for daily operations and I do my thing, I do signing, and I change that key, I need to talk to my parent. So I need to talk to the com.co.uk people when I change the key, and I need to say, you have to put a new delegation signer record. And your private key might be very important. You're a big bank, so the, the private key is locked in a special little device, which is very expensive and hard to operate. Um, it might be very hard to do. So you only want to do this a couple of times. On the other hand, you have daily operations. You want to sign your zones every day a couple of times. And, and you want to have access. And junior sysadmins need to have access to the system. And you want to make sure that you can change keys when these junior system admins uh, leave the company, just as a security policy. Um, there's a whole uh, 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 slew of things that you want to, want, want to do. So you have different operational characteristics for the use of keys. The things that you interact with with your parent are costly. The things that you do on a daily basis, you want to make as cheap as possible. So you want to maybe do different things with your kids. So the solution there are, um, are, are 
Zacchaeus keys zijn in keys en zoon zijn in keys. There is the option to split, to use two kinds of keys in your operational environment. Zone signing keys and, and key signing keys. The zone signing keys are the things that sign everything in your zone. The key signing keys are uh, keys that only sign the keys, the key set. This is abstract, I know. This is difficult. This is hard to comprehend, but you get the, the animation in a bit. I hope things fall into place then. Um, the DS record from the parent, they point to the next key in the chain of trust. And usually that will be uh, a key signing key. Yeah. And then the other keys that are si signed by a different public key, private key, have a public key that lives in the DNS key, uh, uh, RR7. And you trust them uh, because you managed to validate the key signing key. Um, why would you do this? Well, basically because you have different operational uh, 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 requirements for these keys. Um, we, um, there is a, a, a document, an RFC, RFC uh, 4641. And we're currently working on a revision of that. Uh, RFC 4641 um, is a... Uh, 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 a DNSSEC practices document. And it describes uh, 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 considerations why you use DNS key and zone signing keys and, and so on and so forth. And in RC4641, we actually argued that there are cryptographic reasons to, to use uh, zone signing keys and key signing keys. We're now working on a revision of that document in the ITF and we removed all those cryptographic uh, considerations. Those are not there. Cryptographic requirements, this is a, a detail, are all the same. The reasons why you want to make a split between zone signing keys and key signing keys are purely operational. The reason why you want to do that is because things might live on a smart card. Your key signing key is something that you, you want to protect because if that is compromised, if somebody steals that key, or walks away with it, a disgruntled employee or something walks out of your, your office with the key signing key, you have to talk to the parent, it's an expensive operation, you might have to, you know, lo lose uh, face, it's not something that you can solve quickly, uh, there's all kinds of timings involved, um, it's a difficult operation. So key signing keys you want to be careful on, and, and, and depending on the importance of your operation, you might want to do this in hardware and put it on uh, smart cards and all kinds of stuff. Zone signing key, however, you need on the daily operation. And depending again on your environment, you might have this uh, private key sitting on a, on a, on a, on a, on a server that does dynamic updates. So it lives online. If you have a key that lives online, on a server online, you actually want to make sure that you have a key signing key that is not online. So that if the zone signing key is compromised, you can quickly change the, key, the, the zone signing key. Um, so there is a bunch of operational um, uh, uh, considerations that you might want to think about when choosing a scheme where you use a key signing key and a zone signing key. It is perfectly viable and, and perfectly okay to not do that, to use one key and forget all this complication about zone signing keys and key signing keys and just use one. That's a perfectly valid choice. Personally, I would try to be conservative in what you do. Anyway, once you generate this uh, stuff, you need to send the key signing key to the parent. The key signing key needs to go to the parent, and the parent will need to generate the DS. How to do that is very system dependent. This is one of the deployment problems of DNSSEC currently. If I want to uh, uh, get a secure delegation, I need to go to my registrar, and my registrar needs to uh, accept a, 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 a DNS key or a DS set and, and shove it through to the registry. Not every registrar is equipped for this. 
In fact, in the Netherlands, I have a very hard time finding a registrar that can do that for us. There are a couple of registrars that can do it for, uh, for .org. Um, GoDaddy is one. There are a couple of others. But I used to be with Dotster, and Dotster just doesn't do uh, uh, DNS sec, so I moved from registrar. But this getting your key set to the parent might be problematic. And I don't know how, for instance, uh, uh, Brazil and uh, uh, Brazil is signed as well. Huh? Yeah, Brazil and Colombia are signed. I don't know how they do that, and if they have registrars that actually have a, a good service, or that maybe you deal with the registry immediately. I don't know the set in your environment. But getting, if if I am, you know, if I'm a company and I sign the NSEC, uh, I, I need to get that information to my parent. That's um, the parent needs to check the, the, the child zone uh, first and make sure that everything is uh, consistent and then it will generate the DSR. So as a registry, uh, 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 top level domain registry, I don't know how many people here in the room operate top level domains or are associated with it. You need to have a system that can actually do that. And if you delegate further yourself, you also need that kind of system. Anyway, so suppose we have a chain of trust. Remember everything starts with the root. <clears throat> Remember everything starts with the root. It's the origin root here. Um, and from my perspective as a validating name server, I have configured a key that I trust. And the key that I trust is a, the root key, the dot, with a key ID that I call 8907. This is configuration. This is what I did. This is what I configured in my life or in my soul. Um, get this key from my vendor, or I have looked it up online, found it at Diana. This is the first step. Now, when I want to um, resolve a particular domain, um, let's see which domain we are resolving. I actually do not know. I think it's foo.net that we're looking at. But at the moment that I, um, uh, that, that I get an answer, I get a delegation, um, I ask uh, the, 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 the root zone, I ask the root zone for foo.net, I get the delegation. Then the root zone will give something back that says, um, here is a, uh, a delegation, and here is the DS record for .NET. And that DS record points to a next key with key ID 4835, a certain algorithm, and it is signed. There is an RRC over the DS with a made with a certain key ID. So when I try to validate, this is the recursive name server, right? That do it. This software is doing this. When the software tries to validate, it will look up if it has a key with key ID 2983. That key exists. 2983 is a ZS key, zone signing key. And how do I trust that? Well, I can trust it if it is signed by a key that I already trust. Well, it's signed with the RSIG here, the DNS key R set, so all the DNS keys are signed with the DNS key made with 8907. This is the key signing key. So the key signing key with ID A907 has signed all the DNS keys. And if I trust the 8907 key, I can trust this whole lot. And because I trust this whole lot, I can trust also 2983, which has signed the DS record, which means the next uh, key that I trust will be the net key 783. And I trust 8, uh, 8907 because I hard configured it. So, oh. What happened? Yeah? Then I get the delegation. I go to um, uh, uh, the .NET zone. And you see this pointer, 7834, points to a KSK here. This means that this key I can now trust. But I want to get to this key, the zone signing key, because there's data underneath here that, that probably signs that. Well, I validate the signature made with this DNS key over the DNS key RR set, so 
H34 to KSK has signed the DNS QR set. And now I can also press 5612. This is another step in my chain of trust validation. Now is the, um, the delegation to foo.net. And um, because 5612 is now trusted, I can validate the signature of a DS made by that record, which means that the foo.net key, DNS key, with key tag 4252, I can trust as well. Same trick again. I don't think I have to explain it, but I now trust the key signing key. Because I trust the key signing key, I trust anything that is signed with it. And because of that, I now trust the zone signing key. And I press the wrong button, and I'm back to following the chain of trust again. But now you can see it. Because I trust things, I can make a next step. And once I've got the zone signing key uh, with key tag 1111 uh, for all the, the, key, the, the, the data in the food.net zone, I can actually validate the www and I'm done. So this is what is being done in your recursive name server. This is what a recursive name server does it validates entities. And here it's in writing, but I just told you that, so I don't have to do it. This is, again, something that software does, but this is also something that you have to keep in the back of your mind when you're doing troubleshooting. Because if you're doing troubleshooting, you want to actually figure out what happened. If something went wrong in the lab, if somebody you know, mistakenly hasn't signed a key signing key or uh, put in the, the wrong DS record that the parent, you know, mistakes get made all the time. Keys that are not, you know, validation that has not occurred. So it's, that is the kind of thing that you want to troubleshoot. So what we talked about is how to go from static configuration, I trust him, I trust him, I trust him, to actually being able to validate. One thing that you can do today, because the root is signed, you can actually configure one key and you can get a shitload of security already. Validating name server, setting up your name server to validate, is actually trivial. Um, but that assumes you have software that is able to do validation. And as far as I know, um, that is only Unix-based material. I am not aware of... I, I, I am aware of our own product that, that will install on, uh, on, on Windows, and I believe that Bind will do too. Um, but packaged software, Microsoft software, will not do validation. But this is typically something for the Unix environment. Um, Unfortunately. So if you have questions, ask Mr. DNS. Um, looking at my clock. Question is until now. This is the theoretic part. I want to land in the world of the living. So I'll show you what, what some, some of these things look like. Let me, let me see if I can do that. Oh, that doesn't work. Sorry. Sorry. 
So um, let's have a look at how an ordinary query looks like. So this is what you would norm normally do uh, with with a, uh, with a with a with a name server. You would query for a record and you would get a name. Um, you can do that with DNSSEC by just adding your this is big, it's a troubleshooting tool. But here you can see what actually happens in practice, where you see um, uh, a question asked with, with DNSSEC, and you see uh, a resource record called the C name here, and you see the RR signate with the C name, um, and, and information uh, below that that, that indicates uh, the, the signature. So the C name, there's an A record here, there's a signature of the A record, and if I were to validate that, um, I would need to look up uh, a key um, uh, with key ID 4101 at the secret working group yeah? So inside of this box, what will happen is that um, a corresponding key is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, is looked up um, at secret working group um, DNS key plus DNS. And what we're now doing is we're acting as if, if we were um, uh, the validating name server and we're going to ask the DNS key uh, that, that has signed this thing. And what you see is you get a, a bunch of resource records back, a bunch of keys, um, uh, 256, 257. This is a, a, an even number, so this is a key signing key. This is a zone signing key. There are multiple key signing keys here uh, and multiple zone signing keys. Um, apologies, multiple zone signing keys. There's two of them. And what we just saw on top of here is that um, the signature was generated with a zone signing key of key ID 4101. And you see that reflected here as well, 4101. Um, so this is a... Um, um, uh, a, a chain of trust that is that is that that that, that you can follow manually, so to speak. Um, there are two DNS keys in this scheme. Um, you might wonder why is that? I only saw one uh, uh, signature there, um, and I'm not going to ask anybody in the audience why that is because I haven't explained it yet. Um, uh, but what what I will try to show you after lunch is. Uh, um, is, is why you uh, have to be careful with keys and why um, uh, having software to do the work for you is very important. Um, let's see. Little minus T. I'm trying something else. which I completely forgot. Um, this is a, a troubleshooting a tool called uh, Drill. And it comes with uh, LDNS, a, uh, a package that we maintain. And what you see here is that Drill is trying to follow the chain of trust. Um, um, and it starts off with a warning that I didn't give any trust key, so it will not be able to verify our authenticity. But it does do a signature check. And the thing that I just showed on the whiteboard, or on the, on the screen there, um, um, is, is exactly the same, uh, s same here. You see uh, 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 DNS keys, uh, key signing keys, and zone signing keys, and um, uh, checking of keys are, are trusted, um, and then uh, a chain of trust is trying to be built. But because of the lack of, uh, of, a, of a trust anchor, it only checks on the signing. But this is one of the tools that you can use. Drill is one of the tools in your package, a package for 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 DNSSEC. Uh, um, 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 uh, uh, troubleshooting. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have the time to go into the hands-on parts of this because 
that would take us two days. Um, but this is one of the things that you might want to look at when you're when you're back home. And um, what we have on the website, the DNS school website, is actually uh, a bunch of links here uh, to uh, 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 tools uh, and, and, and portals that are available uh, with which you can, can help that uh, troubleshooting. Uh, another thing that uh, there is a link in this document is uh, the DNSSEC how-to, um, which is a little bit of, a, of an older document now. It, it needs a revision. Uh, but it's a PDF that contains uh, uh, hints about how to do troubleshooting and so on and so forth. And it's also a description of the steps you need to take if you want to do the hands-on uh, deployment yourself using either BIND or uh, the DNL Net Labs tools. Uh, again, this is, uh, we try to be a little bit vendor neutral with this. Um, I'm showing you this to fill up the time until lunch and not have to start a new, uh, 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 a new session. Uh, but the download of the, the, the how-to is a little bit slow today. So I'm going to go back and give you a little bit of a, uh, an overview here. Actually, this seems to be a, a, an old version of the 